Well, welcome everybody. Hello. It's nice to see you all after all the breaks that we've had. And this is going to be very exciting because I want to take off from where we left off last time. So I'm Dr. Jamnaris, Cardiovascular Interventions, as you all know. And our mission here is to enhance knowledge about diet and how we can change the health of everybody. This is a new paradigm. This is not just about medication. This is about what we've done to ourselves. And you all today will learn about why we cannot stick to a right diet, or if we've tried it, how come it didn't work on us? What happened? Why can't we stick to the plans? We know what's right. You know what's right for you, but you can't do it. And today I'm going to tell you why you can't do it. So let's just dive right into it, okay? So today's topic is why most diets and fasting programs fail. Because I've been doing this for so many years. It's true. The, it, it fails. It fails over and over again. And the question is why? So here we go. This is one of my favorite slides, okay? This shows our evolutionary process. And as you can tell over there, we are the fellow right at the end over there. And what's happened to us? Something has changed. We have, I use this term, we have hormonally changed. Our hormones have changed. Our habits have changed. Our environment has changed. Our food has changed. And look, this is what it's created for us. This is exactly where we're all heading. And we have to get out of this. So, now, a patient comes and says, I tried. I tried, Doc. After two days, I couldn't do this anymore. And then you go into more and more questions. Why? You know you have a problem. And you know that dieting and fasting is needed. There is a problem. And you know what you need to do about it. You've done it before, perhaps, but you can't stick to it. You fail your program. And then you get mad that you failed. You give up. You have tremendous cravings for the food and you have cravings for certain activities, you can't function, you have no willpower. And you say, oh, well, you know, Doc, I just can't do it. And that's not true, because actually, you may feel awful, you feel terrible, you get headaches, you get chills, you get mental fog, disorientation, sweating, anxiety, poor performance, irritability, and depression. Now, don't tell me that those of you who have tried this have not felt these symptoms. You have felt these symptoms, and your relationships suffer. So many people tell me that I have a problem at home with my spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or even a parent, and their relationships suffer. And then they feel terrible and they blame it on the low sugar. I'm having a low blood sugar. That's why I'm feeling so terrible, doc. And then you feel better. You go and eat again. You go and grab something. You feel so much better. Ah, oh, I felt so good now, right? And say, oh, I got back my sugar. So you blame that sugar. And then you start feeling guilty then you're ashamed that you couldn't do it. You start hating yourself. You become isolated. And some people actually make themselves isolated. And then sometimes they feel terrible. Others don't feel bad. They're actually well-functioning addicts. Well-functioning addicts. There are addicts that are walking around. They may have gambling addiction, or they may have sexual addictions, or they may have um, uh, even cocaine or drug addictions, and they're functioning just fine. You'd never know about it. But suddenly the wife finds that there's a whole lot of bottles in the, in the bathroom, or all of a sudden they find out that, oh my God, he's got this gambling habit, and all of a sudden there's no, bill, no, there's no money to pay the bills. There are functioning addicts. A lot of us could be functioning addicts as well. So I'm going to show you that some of these symptoms that you are having actually is because there is a subtle, subtle, very subtle onset of addiction. It is so insidious. You don't even know it's happening to you. You don't even know it's happening. So perhaps you're addicted to food. Perhaps you are addicted to food. We don't think about it that way. Perhaps I can't do this because I am addicted. And is it the type of food? Is it a component in the food? And are there substances in the food that cause an addiction? Or is it because the food has been converted into a product? And therefore it's no longer any, it's not longer food. So today I'm going to try to throw some light on this. There are foods that will addict you. There are components in the food that will addict you. And yes, it's a product. You are consuming products, not food. And because you're consuming a product, you become addicted to it. There's chemicals in it. There's substances in it. The formation of it has changed. You know, the consistency of the food has changed. And hence, it's no longer real food. And therefore, perhaps you are being addicted. 
So let's go and take a look at some more. So the importance of eliminating processed foods. Why? Why is processed food so bad? I blame processed foods for possible addiction. Processed foods cause high insulin levels. We've talked about that in my previous talks. It causes weight gain. It causes metabolic syndrome, toxicity and inflammation in the body, intestinal dysbiosis. What does intestinal dysbiosis mean? Which means that the, the bacteria in your intestines, they change as a result of what's getting down there into the stomach and into the intestines. So because your bacteria change, you change. Because you are a symbiotic relationship between your physiology and the physiology of the bacteria. So perhaps they changing. As a result of their changes, can you get addicted? Yes, you can. Are there chemicals released by those bacteria that get released into your bloodstream and can affect your physiology? And the answer is a definite yes. Because remember that almost 50% of the micronutrients that are floating around in your body have been either manipulated or produced by the bacteria in your gut. And then it gets into your bloodstream. So don't think that your physiology is just your physiology. It's your physiology is a sum total of yours plus all the physiology of the bacteria and everything that it's doing. You're a symbiotic relationship. So that's very important. And could addiction cause behavioral disorders? Of course it does. Behavior changes when you're addicted. Just think about it. If someone is addicted to cocaine, for example, or intravenous uh, heroin, his entire behavior is going to change. He's, there's going to be denial. There, he's going to be doing certain things that he would never, never expect him to do. He's going to be manipulative. This is so important that in order for me to talk about weight loss, in order for me to talk about maintaining your, your diet and changing your physiology and your biochemistry and your hormones, I got to talk about some addiction because I want to reverse my metabolic syndrome. I want to reverse diabetes. I want to reverse sleep apnea. I want to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, degenerative joint disease, dementia, and even some cancers. Because if we do not lose weight, if we do not metabolically get back to the way we need to be, we are in deep trouble. Losing weight is not the only go goal. Let me explain something to you. If we change your biochemistry and you change your metabolism, weight loss is going to happen. Because it's not a weight loss program. You're basically changing your physiology and you're changing your hormones. And weight loss is just a side effect of it. And automatically your weight goes to where it needs to go to. What changed it first was the biochemistry the hormones, and your entire body's system changes, then the weight loss happens. So, what are processed foods? How do you define a processed food? This is so important. This is of utmost importance. We should be telling this to all the children who are watching. Processed foods, they are not found in nature. Not found in nature. So anything that's in a packet, a box, manufactured in a factory, that comes ready-made, that's a product. Are you going to continue to consume products? Because if you do, there's a good chance you're going to get addicted. Combination of substances that are not found in nature. For example, combination of fat and sugar. Name me one substance that's in nature that is fat plus sugar. Name one. Can you name one? There's not one substance that occurs in nature with that type of combination. Now, when the body sees these combination of nutrients coming in, how's it going to react? So there's lots of biochemistry I can talk about. I can talk about the mitochondria, and the mitochondria is being bombarded by the sugar, but then along come the fats also. It's causing like a, like a congestion on a highway, and this poor mitochondria cannot function properly. And what symptoms are you going to get when you get mitochondrial dysfunction? You're going to get fatigue and tiredness and lack of energy. I'm just giving you one example. But these combinations, these unnatural combinations cause an unnatural reaction in your body. The body is superbly designed to handle nutrients in certain combinations as they come in. For example, I've talked to you about fiber before. I told you that there are two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble fiber. So when the fiber is mixed in with the food that's naturally produced, the fiber goes in, it forms a little mesh in the duodenum so that 
the sugar that's mixed in and the carbohydrate that's mixed in with the food does not get exposure to the K cells in the duodenum. So the duodenum doesn't see all that sugar, so it doesn't send a signal via GIP to the pancreas to say, hey, give me all the, pancreas, uh, all the pancreatic juices you got. Give me all the insulin you possibly got. It doesn't do that. There's a small reaction. So the pancreas produces a small amount of insulin. Why? Because the fiber prevented that sudden surge in the insulin production. And then as the food goes down, it slowly, slowly gets absorbed. So there's this nice, slow dissipation of the nutrients into the bloodstream. That doesn't happen when you eat foods without fiber, in, without its natural state. You see, nature makes these packages because it's designed that way. And we then have our body because we evolved in this way two and a half million years ago with those nutrients to be, to be able to handle those in that package the way it comes. So the combinations of fat and sugar are an unnatural combination, modified by man, made into a product such as flour. There's no such thing as flour out there in nature. The steel mill got invented, as I told you all before, in the year 1860-something. And since then, the instance of degenerative joint disease, heart attacks, myocardial infarction, and diabetes has gone off the roof. Look, that even when you masticate your food, the mastication produces a certain amount of grinding down of the food, but it never makes it into a powder. There's no way you got that great teeth. Do you? I don't have that kind of teeth either. So what happens is that this powderized stuff gets right in there and creates this tremendous surge in hormones because it doesn't know what to do with it. This is totally unnatural. Now, if you give pellets to the rats, their response in hormones, their weight, activity, everything's totally different than if you give them the same food in a powderized form, same grams, same weight, but in a powderized way. So the more refined the product is, the greater the release all of a sudden. So all flour, in my opinion, all flour should be avoided. Not only is the flour bad for you for this reason, but it stripped off everything, the endosperm. You took out the germ, you took out the outer bran, and you left with that pure carbohydrate, and then you ground it way, way down. And that's what flour is. Flour is a survival food. It was made so that you extract all these things so that now it can last forever. So now you can put it in a sack and you can get it through winter, and you can actually survive through winter. It's a survival food, but now we use it every day. Every day we're addicted to this, and I'll show you how we're addicted to it. So, flour, chemicals added, salt, sugar, colorings, sweeteners. Sweeteners are addictive too. I'll show you. Sweeteners are addictive. You know people who are taking diet Cokes and they just, oh, diet drinks, <coughs> sodas, they, they just cannot. Oh, yeah, I got off my, my regular sodas, but now I'm on diet soda. So how much diet soda do you have? I have about four of them a day. You know, I just go through the day with my diet sodas. I'm doing You're addicted. You're addicted because the same sweetness, such as sucrose, get to the brain, to the dopamine centers, which we'll come to in a second, but they stimulate the same place as sugar does. So what happens? The sweet taste in the mouth. So in this case, it's not the calories that are going in there. It's not the sugar that's going to the dopamine center. It's the taste. Insulin is already going to get secreted, and you're already setting up an addiction. So even with, with this sweetness, there is a small insulin response. It's a cephalic phase. That sweet taste on your tongue causes all that. And then in anticipation, you become more hungry because you get certain hormones secreted into the bloodstream, such as orexin, for example. But basically, the long and short of it is diet drinks don't make you lose weight. Diet drinks don't improve your physiology. Diet drinks actually make you more addicted, and you end up eating more and gaining more weight, and your physiology does not get better. So that's just another example. We add uh, caffeine and preservatives and processed oils. Caffeine. Caffeine is an addictive substance. Well, I don't have to tell you more about caffeine. You all know about caffeine already, right? Preservatives. These preservatives that are in our food, why do you need a preservative? Why do you need a preservative in the food? Because you're looking for something that's processed, got a long shelf life, right? So they put some chemicals in it, so it'll last forever. Yeah, so you take some of those french fries and you put them out there, and they'll still be there a month later, and nothing's happened to them. <laughs> Nothing. It's still like that. They, even the bugs won't eat it. And they don't go bad. Because they've got the wrong oils in them. They've got the vegetable seed oils in them. That keep them just the way they are. And did you all know that sugar is a preservative? 
That's why you add sugar to everything. All processed foods have sugar. Why do they have sugar in them? It's not just for your taste. It's because they also want to preserve the food. Right? It's a great preservative. You put something in, sh in molasses or sugar, it's going to stay there, right? So it's a preservative as well. Salt is a preservative too. So all these preservatives and all the chemicals that they add to it, the antioxidants and everything else, they all are and not unnatural. They are like putting stuff into the mailbox that have a zip code that you've never ever heard of. What does the post office do with it? Doesn't know what to do with it. Body doesn't know what to do with these things. Processed oils. Let me tell you about a little bit of processed oils. You all should go and look at some YouTubes on how processed oils are made, such as for any of these vegetable oils. They call them vegetable oils. There's not, not a single vegetable oil comes from a vegetable. But they call it vegetable oil because you are all suckers. You're going to go and buy it. Oh, it's very, very, very good for me. It's vegetable oil, right? It's not animal oil. Because you all have been indoctrinated into thinking that animal oils were bad. Because they're saturated. But these are polyunsaturated. But in order to make them, they got to process so many seeds. And from the seeds, they're very high in omega-6, very high in omega-9. And these are pro-inflammatory. Not only are they pro-inflammatory, but they also are addictive. This is something else that nobody knows. If you take rats, I know we are not rats, but I do talk about rats a lot because I read so many studies on rats. And if you give them their food and you, they're mixed with vegetable seed oils, they're more likely to become addicted to it. By the way, I'll tell you something else. When I was a fellow, we used to do research. And on these rats, you want to create a uh, model for cancer, we used to give them vegetable oils. It grows cancers. Vegetable, if you see the processing of vegetable oil, I promise you, you will not consume vegetable oil anymore. Just go see how it's made. All the chemicals they use and everything, else, how it's created is terrible. So, oh, full of omega-6. And I think that this is one of the main reasons why a lot of populations who should not be having coronary arteries are having coronary arteries. And the one that, of course, is very close to me is because I'm from, my ancestors from India. And in India, they use vegetable seed oils now instead of using the previous animal oil, which was ghee. And I think this is the, one of the main reasons, combined with a high carbohydrate processed food diet, that in India today, we have the highest incidence of coronary arteries in the world. It's vegetable seed oils. And they need to change the diet today to go back to eating the oils that they used to eat before. I already mentioned fiber to you. Anytime you take out fiber, it's no longer a food. It's a product. Anytime you even take out fat from it, that's a product. Skim milk is not milk. That's not milk. That's a product. You took out the fat from it. It didn't come like that from the cow or the goat. So these are all products. They're unnatural. They're not supposed to be like that. Show me a cow that gives you milk without fat. There's not one. Highly palatable foods. When the cereals first came out, Dr. Kellogg said, this is the first pre-digested food we have. Yeah, it is pre-digested. It's on your tongue. It's ready in your bloodstream. I mean, it's so fast. It's so ultra palatable. It's not supposed to be like that. Who said that it's supposed to be like that? That, oh yeah, it's so processed, so you can just put a cereal in your mouth and it's already causing your blood sugar to go up. Your body is supposed to work on it. That's why we have such a long intestine. Others, you'll have a little short little intestine. But we don't have a short intestine. We have a very long intestine. And we have all these different hormones in there. And we have bacteria. And this is, this is a process by which that is supposed to slowly go through before it gets into bread. Breads, chips, cookies. All pre-digested foods. They're all pre-digested. And now, let's move on and show. So do these altered foods have a different metabolic process? And yes, they do. I already told you that real food has less insulin production, therefore less obesity, less diabetes, less addiction, and no unnatural combinations and additives. And they are nutrient-dense packaging. They have everything in them. They have the fiber. They got all the vitamins in there. And they got the starch in it there as well, all in one package, the way it is found in nature. And then uh, early satiety. Oh, that's very important, early satiety. So early satiety means that you eat that food and you feel full. So you're not going to overeat. You cannot overeat that. If I give you a proper piece of steak, nice one, grass-fed, I bet you if I give you this much, you won't be able to finish it. But if I give you a processed food, you'll keep eating, keep eating, keep eating. Half an hour later, you can keep eating. An hour later, you'll come back for more. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied when you're eating processed foods. So, how can you get addicted? 
So we now know from animal studies and from other functional imaging studies that there are neurological changes that occur in the brain. Wait a second, you mean to say your brain is being rewired by the processed food? And the answer is yes. So why would nature get you hooked onto processed foods? Why? Why would I get hooked on it? What's so good about it? Well, because they are caloric dense, they're very high in energy, okay? And in a time of caloric density, more than 20,000 years ago, actually more, even more than that, you know, there were no, there were no calories around. Man had to forage for himself, he had to make a hunt and kill, so there weren't any calories around. So when there were calories around, there you go, the body said it's going to reward you for finding the calories. But you had to work hard to climb up the tree to get to the honey, hmm? or you had to really chase down that uh, wild boar and kill it. And all that energy expenditure, and then you got to get the calories, right? 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 So in the days of caloric scarcity, when these calories came about, the body gave you that reward center. It said, yeah, this, that was good, because it wants you to get the calories. But your genetic material and how it handle, handles the nutrition hasn't changed in 10,000 years. And now, guess what? We are surrounded by calories all the time. There's calories everywhere. There's calories in your car. There's calories in the, in the elevator. In the elevator, you got to eat while, the, while it's going up. You got to take a couple of gulps as well. So, I mean, there's calories everywhere. You go home, there's calories everywhere. You don't have to wait for anything. Now, this last sentence, I actually borrowed it from a, one of the books that I was reading, and I can't remember who. It says, you're a cactus in a rainforest. So what that means is, you're, if you're a cactus, you are made for a desert where you get periodic rain and moisture. You take that cactus and put it in rainforest, what's going to happen? It's going to die. Soon it's going to get sick. First of all, it's going to get all waterlogged and wimpy, and then it's going to die. And that's what we are today. You're all cactuses that were made for one environment and one type of survival, and now you're in a rainforest where it's just too much, plenty, plenty calories all the time. And that is our problem. Too many calories, too many processed foods, all the time, eating too frequently. That's why all of you, I hope you've watched my previous ones on how to, how to fast and the amazing benefits of fasting. You are made to fast, by the way. I mean, I do this, I say this every day, that your body was supposed to have a hormetic stress on it. A hormetic stress means some sort of a stress. 20,000 years ago, what was the biggest stress? Not having enough food. So one day you eat, one day you don't eat. One day there's plenty of food, next day or two there may not be enough food. Okay, so your body was made in that environment and therefore your physiology is also one where you take calories, then you don't take calories. So then you clean up. You build, you repair, and, you, and then you clean up your act, you, you get a chance to repair your body. That's what it's supposed to be in. So that's what a cactus is, but you're in a rainforest. So what about these processed foods? So nature pre-wired us that if you see lots of calorie-rich foods in the survival era, it goes to the dopamine center. And the dopamine goes, aha, I got it. I'm rewarding you. Feel good. That's why you feel so good when you eat junk food. Because you're wired for that. But it doesn't know. The brain doesn't know the difference. So I'm going to show you here. And we have calories everywhere, food is available all the time, more caloric dense than it was 20,000 years ago. Lots of sugar, beets, cane, processed foods, without other components such as fiber, basically naked calories that we have today. And I mentioned earlier on that there are other things that can also affect the, uh, the brain function. So let me explain something. Overeating downregulates the dopamine, opiate, serotonin, and the cannabinoid pathways in the brain, reduces cognitive function, and increases the stress pathways. So let me explain all this to you. So along comes the sugar, and you take it in, it goes straight to the dopamine center, and you get a little surge. Ah, oh, I feel good. You rewarded yourself, you feel fantastic. Next time you eat the sugar, it's going to take a bigger amount of sugar, larger load, to get that same rise. The third time you're going to it, Again, more and more. So you develop tolerance. So now it takes more and more to feel good. And that's how you become addicted to it. Now the body, anytime you get something, there's a counter-regulatory mechanism in the body. 
So if you're getting the reward, then guess what? You're going to pay a price. And what, what price are you going to pay afterwards? So it's a seesaw, right? So you get some, some reward because you ate all this. Well, guess what? There's a buildup of chemicals in your brain that are going to do the opposite thing so that eventually get balanced. So the good, you're going to feel bad also. So there's a time lapse in which those chemicals that would make you feel lousy, depressed, tired, sleepy, all those molecules accumulated as the counterbalance. But if you still keep giving yourself a high, high, high every few hours, these on this side just continue to accumulate. This was beautifully illustrated in a book. Um, it's called The Dopamination. And I encourage you all to go and read this book. It's fantastic. But it shows you how the constant dopamine hit that we are getting from constantly eating processed foods and all those calories is causing this dopamine center to become more and more, more less tolerant. So it needs more and more stimulation and you build up all these chemicals. Now what happens is if you don't eat that, you've got all these chemicals that are built up which are the opposite of reward. You feel lousy. You feel depressed. You feel irritable, you can't concentrate on anything, you, 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 basically you're paying the price of that, that you just had the reward, 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 reward. And why do you get all those rewards? One, you ate the wrong foods. Number two, you ate them too frequently. It's all to do with the brain and the, how the brain reacts to these things. Now, in a true addiction, what also happens is that there are, chemical, there are electrical pathways in the brain that connect from one part of the brain to the other. So the, the dopamine center has rostral connections that go to the prefrontal cortex, for example. Now, if you're an addict, do you want to have a lot of insight? Does the body want you to have insight into your addiction? That, oh yeah, I'm an addict and I, I, I shouldn't be doing this and this is wrong and I'm feeling this. No, it doesn't want you. It wants to make you dumb. So what it does, it down-regulates your prefrontal cortex. So when you're eating all these foods, it's just like a junkie who's taking cocaine. He doesn't know. He's got no insight because he's got no frontal lobe function. He has no reasoning power. He has no willpower either to stop. Because his brain has truly changed as a result of the addiction. There are true structural changes and biochemical changes in his brain because of this addiction. Now, whether you're taking cocaine, amphetamine, Heroin, cocaine, oh, I already mentioned sugar, preservatives, all the same. Caffeine, all the same. They go to the same center. The brain doesn't know the difference. So the after effect is the same thing. You get that addictive affect. Frontal lobe function goes down. Your entire brain has actually truly changed. And this is the problem that I'm seeing. And hence, that's why when I question these people, this is, I did my residency and we used to see drug addicts. And these guys are behaving like a drug addict. I never believed it until I started reading this book. And this book was all about addiction. And I said, oh my God, this is real. I didn't believe it. I did not believe this was possible until I started reading about it. And now it is so well established. But unfortunately, it's going to take years before people realize this. So... The stress pathway, which is the opposite pathway of the reward, causes cortisol re uh, secretion. And it also causes other hormonal secretions as well and creates a stress pathway. Now, if you look around, your stress is ubiquitous. Everyone's stressed out. Now, I know that life is stressful, but I say to you that part of the stress response is also the food that you're eating. All these comfort foods cause stress. Also, so you may feel comfort for a while. Well, guess what? You're going to be really stressed out later on. And we know that from caffeine already. You feel really good. There's always a price to pay. Your energy goes down. After two to three hours, your energy goes down. There's always a price to pay. The body is a homeostatic mechanism, right? Homeostasis, which means that there's a seesaw. Everything has to balance out. You get a real reward. There's a price to pay afterwards. No wonder people are depressed. No wonder they can't function so well. No wonder they... they, they, they this is all because of addiction. This is all because of addiction. Now there is life in stress too. But I'm telling you that the food is one of the reasons. Right? Now the evidence of addiction of high caloric density foods. Three dopaminergic pathways are activated in addiction. Identical to regular drug addiction. The mesolimbic system, 
the, the mesoacumen system, the nigrostriatal pathways. So basically, you want more of it. Your whole functioning changes. You crave for things. Your actions go for it as well. Just like a real drug addict. And your, your decision making and execution of function changes. See? You, you, you just you become an auto, o, automatic person. Now, how many people do you know that just they, on their way home, they can't help it. They have to make that left turn and they got to go into the fast food store to get, get the soda drink and, and they got to get their foods, the fast foods. And you know all these people and they have to eat it on the way home. And then you ask them afterwards, were you really hungry? No, I wasn't. But they do it. They do it. Because they're addicted. And the sad thing is they don't even know that they're addicted to it. That's my problem. That then they become desensitized by the repeated administration of the same initial reward causing tolerance. It is so, it, it, it is so stealth. It just creeps on people. They don't even know this is happening to them. They don't. So here, here's a little picture of just, just the kind of diagrams that connect to the free prefrontal cortex and, and where all these chemicals work. And by the way, the brain does not know the difference. Whether it's alcohol, caffeine, whether it is uh, amphetamines, cocaine, or sugar. It knows no difference. Doesn't know. It behaves the same way, the same chemical pathways, the same everything. So, dopamine traces, okay, used in PET scan showed the same patterns in drug addiction as in addicted obese patients. So they do functional imaging on the MRIs, same pattern. You look at them, you cannot tell the difference. And the prefrontal, this is one that bothers me. I'm sorry for the typo there, but it says prefrontal hypometabolism is noted in obese patients. Man, the frontal lobe goes on vacation. The frontal lobe goes on vacation. Okay, functional imaging studies, very similar to addicted patients. These are the kind of images that we look at, functional, see which part is lighting up. There's an alcoholic, obese, cocaine, you really can't distinguish who is who. It's the same kind of changes in the brain that occur with sugar. And this has been done in animals as well and in humans. So the cognitive impairment causes the cravings. You crave, <laughs> you crave for it. And you can't learn and memory, memory is affected. Guys, this bothers me about sometimes what we're seeing in our schools as well. We need to be careful what we're feeding our children. Because if this is true, then the memory abilities are going down, the cognitive functions are going down. This bothers me a lot. And decreased attention span has been noted in binge eaters as well. Loss of impulse control. This is, this is very, very serious stuff. So. The cues, a small stimulus causes a surge in the neurotransmitter centers in the brain. So uh, you even think of food and you get that response in your brain. And they release these hormones, orexin, leptin, insulin, and um, even advertising of foods. You see it and that's your cue. You're a robot and you go for it. Or you get home, your arms stretch out for the for whatever your fast food is, and you, just, and you just start eating. And then you say, wait a second, why did I do that? It's an automatic motion. Even the motion becomes automatic. This is, and then, so, so I threw this, this slide in there. It says addiction severity index. So how bad can this possibly be? So processed foods are consumed in large amounts over a longer period of time. So you start eating more and more and more of it. There's a persistent desire or unsuccessful attempts to cut down. I mean, they try to cut down, but they can't. That's an addiction. A greater deal of time is spent in activities necessary to get the processed foods and consume them, and a greater amount of time to recover from the effects. You get cravings, strong desires, and then you get recurrent um, food consumption causes failure to fulfill obligations. You know, folks, sometimes I've seen people, it affects their work. Their food habits are affecting their work, home, or school. So it actually affects them. It affects relationships as well. Husbands and wives argue they have problems because of the food, because of the behavior and eating habits. So they have persistent or recurrent interpersonal problems. Um, social, occupational, and recreational activities are given up because now they, they just can't do it. And they don't get enjoyment from that anymore. 
because the only enjoyment they're going to get is from the processed food. So what happens? It downregulates the enjoyment from other things. So one of the things I tell these, my patients, of course, is find something that you really used to like to do and start doing more of that. Because when they start doing more of that, they'll get less pleasure out of the consumption of processed foods. Because honestly, those who are already addicted, you'll notice, you'll ask them, you used to play a lot of tennis before, you used to go on this before, you used to go on to the, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I used to do a lot of boating before, I don't do that anymore. And you'll notice that their lives have changed. Their lives have changed. It affects so many things. And then they know that it's bad for them. They know it. So then they start feeling guilty. Then they go through all that guilt cycle. And that's such a bad thing to have guilt, you know. Um, so tolerance is defined as a need for increased amounts of processed foods. And we know that. This happens. I see it all the time. And then less and less benefit from it. So you just don't feel good until before you used to drink this much coffee now you and two cups maybe a day now you drink four cups of coffee a day. Withdrawal as manifested by either of the fun. Okay. Characteristic withdrawal symptoms. You start sweating. You start getting hangry. Yeah, you get hangry. That's a withdrawal symptom my friend. I'm sorry. There's no denying about it. Processed foods are consumed then to relieve the symptom. I feel so much better when I went to eat. Why, 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 why would you get hangry? You think your sugar level dropped? It's not that the sugar level, your sugar level cannot drop unless you are taking insulin injections or you have reactive hypoglycemia or you have an insulin producing tumor in your body. So most of the patients, when, when I'm trying to do this, on, they get, they're often diabetics. So I sometimes put a continuous glucose monitoring on them. And I show them that, look, when you felt bad, your sugar level was 100 or 80 or 90 or 110. This is not your sugar withdrawal. This is something else that's causing your problem. So when you have, right, the certain thresholds of use, two to three symptoms, mild, four to five of those symptoms that I mentioned earlier on, you have moderate, or six or more, you have severe addiction. So if we go back again here, look, there's 11 questions, right? So you need to answer these questions and tell me how many did you score positive on? Now this is another addiction scale. This is from the uh, Yale Food Addiction and you all can actually go on the internet and find this and answer these questions. And they're pretty much similar to the questions that I've already been asking but in more detail of how often do you find that um, you're constantly seeking food in the daytime? Do you feel fatigued, sluggish after you overeat? Uh, basically, I would like you guys to just go on the internet and look at the Yale Food Addiction Scale. Um, uh, when I read this, uh, it, really, it really bothered me. I was pretty scared. So, poor impulse control. Because I told you your frontal lobe went to sleep, right? You blame, shame, and deny. Of course you do. Which drug addict do you know, or gambler, or, or, or someone with other food addictions will plainly come out and admit everything? They're going to deny it. Of course, it's part and parcel of it. And emotional avoidance, and oh, by the way, relapse and cravings. So, you know, relapse, I've got to say something about relapse. They will relapse. So you relapse once, twice. It's not the end of the world. You should expect a relapse. So it happens to people. Sometimes what happens is people go on my, my program and they say, okay, I'm not going to eat processed foods anymore and I'm going to do the fasting program. Because why do I like fasting so much? Avoid processed foods. But why do I like fasting? Because fasting gets rid of it all. There is no food, so you don't have to make a choice of process or non-process. Basically, there's no choice. There's no food, period. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, number two, take an alcoholic, for example. I used to put him in the ER in a padded room and leave him there for three days. After three days, is he craving for alcohol? No. Until he goes out and gets another cue or his buddies or his facilitators come and give him another drink. But he no longer craves because the craving goes away. So you do a fast fasting program like I, I tell people to do, your cravings go away. Your addictions go away. And then you detoxify yourself. Your toxins get released from your body. 
And remember that it takes three, four, five days for all your hormones to, to start coming back down. Your leptin levels, which you've got leptin resistance, for example, takes a while to come down. Your adiponectin levels need to slowly come back up again. All these take time. They're not going to happen in one day. So this is very important. So I say that, you know, these relapses that people have are to be expected. But sometimes people get a relapse and then they give up. How many times do I see this day in and day out in my office? Doc, I tried. I felt terrible. I couldn't do it. After, after, you know, I was eating once a day for three days, and on the fourth day, I just started eating four times a day again. I just couldn't do it. Now, it maybe the frontal lobe didn't help them, but you know what? You get more willpower after you do a three-day water fast. So lately, I've been telling a lot of my patients who have this problem, and when I suspect that they have some form of addiction, I tell them, give me a three-day water fast. Now, you can't just jump into a three-day water fast. I make them skip a few meals first. I, I, I kind of make them change their diet. And then under medical supervision, I tell them, okay, next week I want a three-day water fast from you. And that breaks the cycle. That seems to break the cycle. A three-day water fast. So you will find that after three days on the fourth day, he's got more willpower. Well, guess what? how did he get the willpower? He just came. He made connections. That frontal lobe is waking up again. The connections are being made again. Those rostral connections from your dopamine center going forward, they actually, you actually have neuroplasticity. And of course, fasting increases your brain to have neurotropic factors. So I know all the chemistry behind that too. But basically, the long and short of it is you change as a person. By doing that three-day water fast, getting out of, of the addiction, and your brain actually changes. Your brain actually changes structurally, and of course, how you think changes as well. So now all of a sudden, you have more willpower. Oh, I can do this. Okay, so muted taste. Vegetables taste bitter to the individuals. Yeah, of course, if you're addicted to, to sugars and other bad foods, and you, do, you hate the taste um, you know, of, uh, of vegetables. Uh, financial problems, relationship problems, social problems, employment problems, physical illness, mental illness. We already kind of talked about that a little bit, so let me just move right on. So, sugar, salt, fats, bad combination, right? Bad combination. Unnatural combination. Sugar affects dopamine levels, I already told you that. And what is our diet in the Western world made of but high sugar and high fat? Bad combination. That combination causes addiction. Because the fats cause addiction, and then the sugar cause addiction. And which fats? It's the polyunsaturated more than the saturated fats. It's the polyunsaturated fats that cause that. Um, so chocolate, caffeine. Um, look at this. At the bottom, it says cannabinoid-like fatty acids. Where do they come from? Processed oils. That's all from processed oils. Yeah. Dairy and cheese. Ah, what's wrong with dairy and cheese? That's ice cream, sour cream, cream, cottage cheese, yogurt, and butter. They contain chemicals called casomorphines. They actually addict you. So you crave for the cheese. And you, how many people do you know who are actually, I have to have my cheese piece every day. I'm addicted to cheese. I love cheese. I can't live without eating cheese. I'm telling you, they're addicted. And that's because of that. These morphine-like molecules are found naturally in milk. Of course it's supposed to be in milk. Why? Because you want your baby to get addicted to you. So when the baby comes and suckles longer, he's going to get more nutrition. Right? So being a, a baby, being a, addicted to milk is normal. We shouldn't be eating milk anyway. But you concentrate all those casomorphines in cheese. Cheese is the concentrate. Now you're getting so much casomorphine. No wonder you get addicted to cheese. Wheat gluten. They have gluteomorphine. Wheat. How many people do you know who cannot stay without bread? They smell bread, they're going to eat it. They see bread, they've got to go eat it. And if there's a loaf there, it's going to be gone. They'll finish half the loaf in one evening. And, the, and, and guess what? A whole half loaf. They're still hungry. I told you, it'll never save you. you. And they put... The, 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 those gluteomorphines, are the, they go to the same parts of the brain as all other drugs go to. 
Wheat, right, come it's spelled barley, corn, bean flour, lentil flour. They're all the same thing. Look, what's the common thing there? It's flour. Don't eat flour. So, what other foods are addictive? Because we're talking about addiction now. Sweetness. You never thought that sweetness are addictive, right? I never thought they were addictive until I did the research. There it is. All those sweeteners, right? They are all addictive. You eat foods rich in these sweetness, you'll eat more of those foods again and you will not be able to live without it. And snack foods, all snack foods are a combination of all the previous chemicals I mentioned. And they're all full of omega-6 processed vegetable oil so you can preserve it completely. They're full of salt and they are all full of sugar and other preservatives. Particle sizes. I already mentioned particle sizes, that they're really bad for you, right? Because you, you don't want to eat foods like that. You want to chew it. You want to masticate your food. That brings me to something else, juices. Now, why on earth would you drink juices? Hmm? There are no mixes out there in nature on trees hanging over there. There's only real fruit. And they come packaged really with the fiber. So now all of a sudden, all those calories go into your body all at one time. And then, oh yeah, you know, so my patients come to me sometimes and they, and they have these green juices or whatever they, they're making at home and they'll put, oh yeah, I, I put a banana in it, I put an apple in it, and, and I put some, uh, some, some, some other spinach and other things in it. It's just made it all green and it's absolutely great. So I said, okay, so take a picture of it all before you juiced it. And it's a rich big pal. I said, now tomorrow, don't juice it, just eat all those things. Duck, I can't eat all that. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. And why are you putting all that down in four gulps? Why? Why are you doing that? Well, the only time you should be juicing is when you have no teeth. All right? <laughs> then I'll let you juice it. Yeah. So the other things that are processed and are very addictive, distillation. What's distilled? Alcohol, high fructose corn syrup. Very addictive, high fructose corn syrup. I already talked about that in my previous lectures. Crystallization. You crystallize something, it's addictive. It's man-made, it's artificial. Sugar, sugar is artificial. Sugar is not natural. Sugar cane is natural. Molasses are natural. They come out of the cane. You take that sugar cane that you grow in your backyard, you grow some sugar cane in your backyard, and you can put it through that little machine and take that juice out, and you can have a little bit of that. Okay, fine, not a lot, but just a little bit of it is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It has a lot of minerals in it as well. But crystallized sugar, crystal, it became crystallized so that you can transport it. You can't transport molasses, but you can transport crystals, and you can preserve them for years. 20 years later, the crystals are still there. So that's why it all happened. It happened for convenience. This didn't happen because it was good for you. Sugar was not made because it's good for you. It was, good. It was made so that it could be transported from the Far East all the way to Europe and not get bad on the way. And then, of course, everyone got addicted to it. Frying foods in vegetable oils, which are addictive, processed fats, uh, and I already told you that they also are addictive, and they, they cause stimulation of the uh, uh, receptors. To, now, interchangeability. I've got to tell you about this. Because look, guys, I'm not talking about one addiction. It's poly addiction. You're addicted to a number of things at the same time. This is awful. And you switch from one addiction to the other very easily. Because look, the dopamine center, I told you, does not know the difference. So you can easily switch from one addiction to the other. So let's say that you're a smoker and you're addicted to, to, to smoking. When you quit, you're gonna start eating too much. And then when you quit that, you quickly go on to amphetamines. And if you quit amphetamines, it's so easy to get onto cocaine, just like that. If you're a caffeine addict, it's very easy to become a food addict. If you're a food addict, it's very easy to become a drug addict. Regular drugs. These are all very interchangeable. Guys, this is really scary. I often wonder, you know, why, why we have an epidemic of all these narcotics and addictions and everything else. Is it just, just availability? Availability is one of them. But the other thing is susceptibility. If we create a susceptible population, a population that's going to be susceptible to addictions, why? Because we're priming them. We're priming the population from a young age, guys. And if you're priming the population into an addiction, they'll move from one addiction to the other to the other. Don't be surprised. So cocaine, alcohol, tobacco, foods, all interchangeable, guys. This is really dangerous stuff. This is really dangerous. 
That's why I got to say this. Kids who eat right grow up to be solid citizens who will not be addicted to other things and other addictive behaviors. It starts from a young age. Everyone out there needs to pay attention to that. It starts with children. It's not about adults. This is all about children as well. Starting at a really young age. Because don't expect them to change when they're 25 years old. When, you, when they've been trained to eat and drink that way since they were three years old. So poly addictions are very hard to treat. These are very difficult to treat. And that's why I like my addiction program, which is basically fast. Get rid of it. But fast. And don't go back onto it. Soft drinks, caffeine and sugar. Look at the combination. Caffeine and sugar. Two poly substances. So you see, I'm not talking about one. You're addicted to two things. Donuts. Look at them. They're full of flour, gluten, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, salt, fat, and chocolate. Because you put chocolate on top of it. I'll give me a Boston cream. Right? I need it right now. <laughs> right? So you, you had so many addicts. No wonder. Look, you, you try to get someone who loves donuts every day. Yes, you have two donuts. Try to get him off the donuts. He'll chase you down. He'll chase you down. Like a real addict. French fries, full of what? Fat and salt. Milkshake, fat and sugar. Snacks, fat and sugar. These are the combinations. Sweets, sugar, cocoa butter, chocolate, milk, soy lecithin. All addictive. All addictive. Palm oil, they contain palm oil. Palm oil, horrible, 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 right? Palm oil, hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated fats and salt. Anything you pick up, if there's a label on it, just put it away. But if you read the label, you'll see it's got all these things on it. Read the labels. But first of all, if it's got a barcode, just put it away. If it comes in a packet, put it away. Don't eat it. It's probably suspect. Now, 57% of the energy intake in the United States population is from ultra-processed foods. Now, that's just scare you. Come on, guys. If all, more than half the calories that you are consuming today come from processed foods, what hope do we have? What happened to real food? No wonder we're not real human beings anymore. Do you see what I mean? This is ultra serious stuff. And if we don't change today, we're going to have a very, very sick population. Forget the sickness. We're going to have a dysfunctional population. Forget dysfunctional population. Our kids are going to grow up to be something we don't even know. We have to be very, very vigilant about what's happened. And this change has all happened, all within the last 80 years, with vegetable seed oils coming onto the market at the turn of the century, and then all this industrialized processed foods coming on, all for your benefit and convenience, of course. Of course. So, we must completely remove all sugars and sweetness from our diet. We should not consume flour. We should not consume large amounts of caffeine. I'm still allowing people to drink up to two cups of coffee a day. But that's enough, no more than that. But if you're addicted, then stop the caffeine too. You can't tell the alcoholic, just have a little bit of scotch every day, you know? <laughs> no, if he's an alcoholic, you stop completely. So if you feel you cannot live without caffeine, you're an addict, you better stop it right now. Not that, oh, I'll just have a little bit of poison every day. Come on, man. No, you don't do that. Starches, sweet potatoes, squash, bran, rice, quinoa, buckwheat, all these starches, avoid them, avoid them. Puffed grains, all cereals. Your children must learn to have proper breakfast, not cereals. No cereals. Cereals are not a healthy food. Abstinent food plants. So what happens with these cereals? Same thing, they get sugar addicted. Those poor kids are getting sugar addicted from the time they can't even read and write and they're already addicts. Um, nuts and seeds. So if you're allergic to them, you don't want to eat too many nuts and seeds. And be careful what kind of nuts you consume. You know, the nuts are walnuts, pecans, pistachios. I love pistachios because they are very high in prebiotics as well. What do I mean by prebiotics? Prebiotics are the chemicals that go into the gut on which the bacteria feed. So pistachios have one of the highest concentration of prebiotics. That's why I like those nuts. So I love, I love pistachios. You should all consume some pistachios every night, right? Yeah. And then soy, typically GMO processed except for tempeh. Avoid soy. Soy is not a health food. Potatoes in all forms, such as french fries, chips, baked and mashed. So processed. We don't want, to, we don't want that. We want to eat 
apricots, pears, apples, peaches, oranges, and grapefruit, tangerines, blueberries, and raspberries, and that too you should consume in season. No melons, kiwi, banana, and grapes, which are typically given to you as a healthy fruit plate. So when I go to a restaurant and say, give me a fruit plate, that's what I'm going to get. All the bad stuff, full of sugar, and no, you know, just terrible. The, 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 by the way, the bananas are, are, are the number one fruit in the United States, right? Overrated. Completely overrated. Oh, yeah, it's high in potassium. No, exactly. There's 30 foods that have more potassium in it than bananas. You know? So, all right. Desired food plants. Cold-pressed oils. Olive oil. Avocado oil. Seed, uh, flax seeds. Uh, coconut oil. And sesame oil. These are good oils. Okay, and they're cold pressed. Avoid vegetables and seed oils such as grape seed oil, sunflower, canola, safflower, cotton seed, cotton seed oil. So even your nuts that I was telling you, I don't mind the nuts, but watch your label because if it is roasted in cotton seed oil or soy oil, you're just getting a whole bunch of omega six into your body, which is pro-inflammatory. So go and get your nuts raw. That's how they're supposed to be, raw, not roasted. You can roast them yourself at home, and then you know what you're eating. Yeah. So, desired food plants on vegetables, asparagus, onions. Onions have a lot of inulin. You know what is inulin? It's a prebiotic, right? So, prebiotics, look, you're eating not for your cells only. You're eating for your bacteria. Yeah, you hope you're getting the theme here, right? Now, you eat those processed foods, the only one that's really hurting yourself is you and you're hurting your bacteria as well but when you start eating the right stuff your bacteria are happy you get a nice diverse microbiome and these are the foods you should be eating onions broccoli brussels sprouts cauliflower cabbage carrots celery beets lettuce spinach pepper eggplant tomatoes cucumber and zucchini now of course some people can't tolerate uh, nightshades but that's the exception so if you don't tolerate it and you feel bad then you come talk to an expert and we'll tell you, okay, maybe you need to cut out the nightshades for now. But generally speaking, these are the good foods, right? Good vegetables. Because remember, there are some foods with lectins in them. And so you all know about Dr. Gundry's books and about the lectins. And you know that if you're going to eat lentils, you've got to pressure cook them so you kill all the lentils in there. You know all about that. We've talked about that on previous talks. The, what is the Paleolithic? Why do I like the Paleolithic diet in general? because it eliminates all the addictive foods. It's found in studies to be better than a diabetic diet. Better than a diabetic diet. Because the dietitians have been giving us the wrong diet. So these poor diabetic patients are being told they've got to eat all these carbs. What are you doing? That's his problem. So I get really frustrated when my diabetic patients come and say, well, I've got to eat this, 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 because I was told I've, I've got diabetes, I've got to eat all these. I say, no, you don't need to eat those. Your body will make all the glucose that it needs. You stay away from all those sugary foods and starchy foods. You don't need them. So a Paleolithic diet is better than a Mediterranean diet also because grains and dairy are eliminated. Grains are, grains are not what they're made out to be. And dairy, I told you, we are the only people who are still drinking milk from another mammal, even though we're adults. Milk was made for the babies. And cravings are eliminated quicker, and there are less relapses because you get rid of your addictive foods. So choose the diet that you want. That's fine, as long as it doesn't contain addictive foods. The best diets in the world are natural diets without addictive foods in it. Because look, otherwise you can go on a gluten-free diet, you can go on a vegan diet, and it's full of addictive foods. Do you get the picture? Or, oh yeah, I'm on this diet, but it's got all the addictive foods in it. So you can be on a vegetarian diet, you can be on a South Beach diet, you can be on any diet, but if they contain addictive foods, you're back to square one. So there's so many people that come to me who are vegans and vegetarians, and it's horrible, they are so sick, they're so addicted to food, and they're vegans. And the vegetarians, no wonder why they're so sick, right? So we gotta be, choose your diet, just eliminate the processed foods. Cravings are eliminated much quicker when you have foods that are whole without any of those. Avoid the cues, so don't go shopping if you don't have to. And stay away from those 
inner aisles and in the home stay away from the pantry and don't go to the break room and, and don't ride straight home don't, don't don't stop by any fast food place and avoid the people and food pushes that's a very big one oh yeah she gets together with a friend or he gets together with his buddy next thing you know it's the beers and the pizzas and everything comes out right oh come on buddy you got to do this man no the answer is no people pushes push people pushes away Just put them away get them away and face your delusions once you get off the addictions, your brain will wake up. You'll become smarter. You will see. So you know what? I tell people till I go blue in the face. But when I make them do my three-day water fast and I get them off these, all of a sudden clarity comes. When clarity comes in you, then you are going to stick to the diet. Until then, it's a headache because it's like he told me to do that. But when you start telling yourself, I feel so much better when I do this. I feel, so, I feel my brain is so much better. My, my, my energy level is so much higher. My clarity is so good. Yes, I'm going to do this. That's when we get there. And to do that, there's a price to pay. The price is you have to go through the withdrawal. You got to face it. There's going to be a withdrawal. You got to face the music. You got to do it. You are going to go through withdrawal if you try this. I'm sorry. It's going to happen. Okay. So. Eat outside your normal structure. That's the first thing I tell them. One o'clock, you eat your lunch. Don't wait for one o'clock. One day, go 12 o'clock. Whoa, 12. Next day, go two o'clock. So you're messing up the, 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 that, that schedule inside your brain. That's how you get off addictions. And then one day, just skip the lunch completely. So don't, don't be so... Dog because what happens, others' ghrelin levels will go up exactly at the times that you normally eat. So then you feel so hungry at that time. Are you a slave to ghrelin levels? You shouldn't be. You should be free to eat whenever you want, not be a slave to all those drives in your body. So the way you do that is you eat outside your eating structure. So one day you get home early, hmm? and you get home early, and your food is there, ready to go, and it's only 4, 30, 5 o'clock. Heck, have your dinner. Your body will say, what happened? Right? But you've got to do that. And then you need to find a support group as well. That's going to support you. And this one is very big. You must expect some failures. Because if you don't expect a failure and you do fail because you caved in for whatever reason and over the weekend you went out and you binged like crazy, you're going to have a lot of self-loathing. I'm telling you, you don't need to loathe yourself. You don't need to hate yourself because that's a very negative emotion. No, it's going to happen. It is to be expected. It's going to happen to you. It will happen to you. So you just get back on that horse and keep riding, man. You just got to do it. C common adverse effects of breaking addictions are headaches. I get a headache done. It's not going to last forever. You're going to get fatigued. Yes, yes, you get fatigued. You, you, it's like a druggie. You're going to get drowsiness, dysphoria mood. That means a little bit of depression type symptoms. Irritability. I'm really hangry. I just say, oh, ah, come around, I'll eat you up. Uh, poor concentration, flu-like symptoms. Flu-like symptoms. You actually get that bodily flu-like symptoms. Same symptoms that a drug addict will go through. Expect it if you're a big addict and work your way through it. Put cold compressors on your body. Tell your loved one or, or spouse or anyone to walk you through it. Lie down. Watch your favorite movie. Drink lots of water. And you'll get over it. Yes, you will get over it. You won't die from it. You'll not die from this addiction. Mm-mm. You know, that's not going to happen. So that will break your dopamine cycle. Okay? And your cravings will go away. After three days, your cravings are gone. And it deconstructs all the maladaptive neural pathways. New pathways will grow in your brain. You'll restore the neurochemical homeostasis. You'll restore your leptin levels. See, a lot of us have leptin, um, le leptin resistance, just like insulin resistance. Our leptin levels are so high, they just don't respond anymore our leptin levels start coming down and start responding. Increase adiponectin levels. So your whole physiology starts changing. I can talk about chemicals for hours, but basically you are restoring your chemicals and hormones back because you are, you've become a hormonally modified human being and you need to get back to the hormones that you are, you're supposed to have. It rewires all your neural pre prefrontal cortex, increases brain-derived neurotropic factor. I told you that's really important. That comes when you fast. When do you get BDNF? When you fast, that's when you get BDNF. Exercise also, by the way, 
increases your BDNF. So one of the things that I, and I don't know if it's on the slide, but maybe on the next slide, but you need to do some exercise. Because exercise will get you through the, the period. So, oh, can I exercise during my fast? Absolutely. In fact, that's when you should be exercising. When you exercise on an empty stomach, you get far more benefits than exercising on a full stomach. Okay? Right before you're going to break your fast, that's when you eat. Now, if you're eating once a day, then you exercise right before you're going to be eating. Right? So let's say you eat at 7 o'clock in the evening. You go to the gym or you go up to your gym at 6 o'clock to your exercise and then go and have your dinner. And none of this high starch stuff. Oh, yeah, i got to starch up. No, you don't. You don't need to starch up. Right? No starch. And it increases your ketogenesis and met metabolic flexibility. What does that mean? Look, there are two major pathways for energy in the body, right? The glucose pathway and the ketones, right, from fatty acids. You need both. One is catabolic and one is anabolic. What does that mean? Your body cannot always be in one mode, anabolic, because you'll never get a chance to be catabolic break down waste products and get rid of them and rebuild. Take your home. You can't just live in that same house for 30 years. You gotta break down that bathroom and rebuild it again. Same way, when you're in ketogenesis or when you are doing intermittent fasting or you're doing once a day eating, right, or any form of fasting where there's prolonged periods of time when you're not eating, minimum, minimum, minimum 16 hours, minimum. That's the bare minimum. When you're not eating for 16 hours, you're inducing some degree of autophagy in your body. Autophagy means you're recycling all your body parts, you get mitophagy, that means your mitochondria, your mitochondria, the senescent ones die, new mitochondria will be formed when you start eating. So when you start, all of a sudden you have more energy. Why do you have more energy? Because you've got new, back, the new mitochondria now. The new mitochondria. After a fast, you get new mitochondria. So there you go. You get, you get stem cell mobilization after fasting. Yeah? You get stem cell mobilization. When does that happen? After 24-hour fasts. You, then when you refeed, you get refeeding uh, reward. And that's, that's why you feel so good after a fast has been broken. And after you feel so energetic, you're on top of the world. You're rebuilding your body. So this metabolic flexibility where your body utilizes glucose, but then also utilizes ketones. Ketones generated how? Your insulin levels must go really low so that the fat stores can be opened up, the fats come out, they get the fatty acids, they get converted in the liver to ketones, and the ketones can be utilized by your body. They are very nice, clean, uh, clean burning fuel. So we talk about that in my other lectures. But ketones are excellent. Your brain can utilize ketones too. But when you're in that state, and it's a hormetic state, Homesis, homesis, homesis means stress. It's creating that stress in your body. That stress that does not kill you makes you better and stronger. You have to become periodically ketogenic. You have to. That's how you were made. You can't be constantly in glucose, glucose, anabolic, 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 anabolic. You'll burn down real quick. So the biggest homitic stress you can create for your body is actually intermittent fasting. Now, there are other homeotic stresses, too. You can go have a nice sauna, and I love sauna. If any of you have cardiovascular disease, I recommend that you all do saunas because saunas have been shown to decrease cardiovascular risk, sudden cardiac death, especially if you have diminished ejection fractions. And all. But, of course, get, do it with, in, in consultation with your cardiologist. But, yeah, that's a homeotic stress. Exercise is a homeotic stress. And then, of course, there's certain foods that create a homeotic effect in your body as well. So, you know, those certain types of spices, for example, turmeric and all those, they, they are actually homeotic. That's how they actually work on you and they make you better. So, there you go, metabolic flexibility, multiple fuels. My body can use multiple fuels, that's what you want. And then improves intestinal dysbiosis, oh, this is so important. And when you do this, you're going to have the microbi microbiome in your gut that's going to be of a wide variety and diversity. And that's what you want because your long-term health is very tightly knit to your microbiome. You have the wrong microbiome, you're sick. And you will not be able to be working optimally. And what knocks out your microbiome? First and foremost, antibiotics, which you already know. You shouldn't be consuming antibiotics unless you really have to, right? right? And you should, on a day-to-day -day basis, replace 
the bacteria that you're killing because uh, there's antibiotics in the foods that you eat. So I always take a probiotic. I like kefir, as you all know, but I also take prebiotics. Prebiotics can be bought also. You can buy powdered inulin with FOS, which is fructose oligosaccharides. So these is clear fiber. So it didn't, you, you just wish it in water and you can't even see it. That's the food for the bacteria. So there's a prebiotics. Prebiotics also in all the fibers that you eat. All the vegetables have prebiotics. So you have prebiotics, you have the probiotics, which will produce postbiotics. The postbiotics are all the chemicals that your body needs and the nutrients that it needs. And there's a strong signal. We can talk about this on another talk. There's a big signal between those chemicals that are released in the gut and they go up to your brain via the vagus nerve and through your circulation and changes the chemistry in your brain. The bacteria change the chemistry in your brain. And it's amazing stuff. Who would think that the bacterial product affects the way I feel, think, and how my brain functions? Absolutely proven, absolutely proven. We'll talk about that on another talk. And then it improves leaky gut. Of course it does, because you're giving the gut a chance to heal. But if you're eating every two, three hours and you're eating all this poison, you'll never heal your leaky gut. And today we get leaky gut for lots of reasons, because the bacteria are all wrong, they cause leaky gut. Food, certain foods can cause leaky gut, the lectins we already talked about, but you may have certain food sensitivities. So. If you feel that that's going on, go and get a blood test. You can see which foods uh, you, you, you're sensitive to. Everyone's made a little bit different. Everyone's different. So you can get that done and get your gut healed. You can get the gut, gut lining healed so they're no longer uh, uh, porous. A porous gut causes immune activation because all those immune cells inside your gut and the cross reactivity and connective tissue. Do you know how many patients in my office come with connective tissue disease? And what I do with them is I work on their gut. I make them change their diet and all of a sudden the joint pains all get better. But how do I do this? It starts with my diet and then fasting. So I had a patient just the other day that came in. Um, I got an email actually from a doctor. Doctor said that he put the patient on, on, um, on my diet. The patient lost 27 pounds and this is the email he received and he sent me the email. The first line she wrote in this, Doctor, I've lost 27 pounds and all my joint pains are gone. Now, it, this wasn't done for her. I did this for her heart, right? She needed, but all her joint pains were gone. All her joint pains are gone. She said, my, I don't wake up with those achy joints in the morning. I feel so good. My joints are so flexible. Where, how did that happen? It's the immune responses that changed in her body. So they, she obviously, she must have had an immune response change because of her gut change. So I wish I could have studied her gut and see exactly what's going on. But that was a nice email that I got from another cardiologist's office. Okay, so fasting for addiction. Why? Because it also induces autophagy. I already talked about that. Mitophagy, it induces the weight loss, positive self-esteem. I told you you're going to feel better about yourself after you've done it because your frontal lobe's working now, and all those depressive nonsense in your brain's gone. You've worked out all those chemicals, all those counter-regulatory uh, chemicals that built up in your brain because of the addiction and positive, 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 dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. All these other chemicals have had a chance to work out. When they've worked out of your brain, now your brain can function normally. So long as you're addicted and you're constantly eating and you're dopamine, 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 those other chemicals don't get a chance to go down. They're constantly accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. Hence you feel depressed, tired, fatigued, even suicidal. Even suicidal. So you get that improved self-esteem, mood, depression, less pain, improved sleep, eliminates fatty liver, gets rid of sleep apnea. Heck, who wants to sleep with a mask all night long? I don't want to sleep with a mask all night long. I've got better things to do. Improves insulin sensitivity, reverses your diabetes, and eliminates all ah, eliminates toxins. So fasting eliminates toxins. So not only does this program for addiction help that, but tox so all these toxins. So some toxins are eliminated very quickly. Okay. So for example, you know you you put all these. Um, creams on your body and the phthalates are there, they'll be gone in 24 hours. But if you keep putting them on you every 24 hours, you're going to get a lot of phthalates in your body. So I tell people, listen, you are toxic. Stop using those unnecessary chemicals on your body. So they're gone. Other plastics that are inside your body, they also slowly start coming out. 
all these organophosphates in your body, all these, all these um, from, uh, from, from your garden and from insecticides and pesticides, all of them will get a chance to get, how are they going to get out from your body unless you fast, right? You detox your body. You have to detox your body because eating can be toxic. So you need to detoxify your body. Okay, and then of course, fasting promotes the metabolic flexibility, which I mentioned in the earlier slide. So you've got to see that previous um, slide. So, oh, the, 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 this slide is just talking about adiponectin, and it's just science, basically. But the long and short of it is that you want to get rid of insulin resistance, and you want to get rid of your inflammation. You want to, you know, the, the, you want to activate the, the AMPK, and we can talk all about that in, on, on, on other days. Um, oxidative stress needs to go down. Um, yeah, so protect the pancreas, and this is a little bit about autophagy. Just a little slide to remind you all that autophagy, which is what comes in after you've done some fasting, especially for addicts, it induces all these positive changes, right? It cleans up the cells, so you get l less um, infections, less fatty liver, less diabetes, less neuro, neuro disease changes. Um, you get less even cancer because you, you're killing off the cancer cells. You're killing off the cancer cells. When you're not feeding yourself, cancer cells die in your body. Because they need food. And which food do they need most? Sugar. Sugar. That's right. Sugar. So you're not feeding them sugar. They starve. Cancer cells die. Yeah. So there you go. So immune system gets better. Uh, cardiomyopathy gets better. And there's less aging. So I want to stop here because... I can talk for hours on, on this. But you know, the, the purpose of talking about addiction was this, that yes, I love my fasting program, and it's worked on hundreds and hundreds of patients, and I thank everybody because I get all these emails and, and, and messages saying how, how, how fantastic they feel and everything else. But I think that those who might be addicted may be missing the boat. I want to bring addiction to the forefront to let people know that down from your kids down to all of us, there's a subtle addiction. Get out of addiction. Develop metabolic flexibility. Change your habits. Become a free person who can eat when he wants or she wants, and no problems. My body is flexible. If I don't eat today, I'm not going to drop dead. I have that flexibility. Develop that, and you'll get all these different, different benefits from it. Stop eating anything that is addictive. You know all the foods that are addictive now, no processed foods, basically. Long in, I think processed food addiction is going to be talked about a lot in the future. So uh, look out for that. But I thank you all very much, and I'm going to stop right there. Thank you so much. For Okay, I, I, I could take a couple of questions if you'd like, but it is late, but uh, I'll take a couple of questions. So, Dr. Gymnotis, um, 300 years ago in the Middle Ages, they ate bread that was not like what we have today. Is there something available like that for us today that's a basic bread that uh, is just a minimally processed grain? Can we get something like there that? There is, today? yeah, there are. There are where where that, can we get very, something? Very, very like difficult that? to find. You, you have to go online, but you've got to eat real whole grain bread. So you've got to get that flour. So it has to be real whole grain. Because remember that the, the government allows you to call it whole wheat bread when only 10% of it is actually whole wheat. It's 90% it's all pure white. But no, they are. They are. And millet bread is better than wheat bread. So the first start would be to go to millet instead of wheat. If you're going to stick to wheat, then it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to find real whole wheat that is brown, hard, and heavy. And basically, the only place I've ever seen that is I buy it on the Internet. On the Internet. Okay. Uh, you didn't mention, so here's the diet I got from you. Uh, fruits, vegetables, you gave us uh, those, no grains. Uh, so I'm looking for meats. You want grass-fed meats? Is Absolutely. what you want? Absolutely. Meats are natural. Meats are out there. They're part of nature. So you are nature, you eat the meat. Okay? But it has to be grass-finished meat. Chicken okay? Chicken is fine. It has to be organic chicken. You see, 
In the old days, I used to talk about being vegetarian and only plant-based and no, no meats whatsoever. No, they, there's nothing really wrong with meats, but it's just that we've been eating the wrong meats because our meats today are all uh, uh, fed omega-6s in grains in all these big lots. So the meat is totally different meat than it was 200 years ago or 150 years ago. So no omega-6, more omega-3, very little omega-6 in it, lots of saturated fat in it, not a problem. The fat that comes in its natural state, in nature, is not bad for you. It's the fats that we have made, processed fats, mm -hmm. they're bad for you. But the fa so if you eat a nice juicy steak with a lot of fat coming off it, I have no problem with it, as long as it's grass finished. I know. I know. And so, uh, I'm sorry, go on. I'm, so I, so I, I love the fats. Uh, chicken, same thing. Uh, shrimps and fish, um, wild-caught salmon. Uh, I like because the others tend to have too many other toxins, including mercury. If you're going to eat regular fish, don't eat it more than twice a week because there's too much mercury in it. Um, yeah, so uh, you can eat fish as well. And eggs, I love eggs, organic eggs. Very good for you. Egg is a complete product. Don't take the yolk and throw it away. Eat it with the yolk. So if we're eating like this, what do you think is a, a goal for calcium for us? If we're eating this way, what do you think? It's certainly not 1,000 or 1,200 milligrams that we need that we hear, right? It's probably lower. Do you have a recommendation for how much calcium we should be trying to get from plants and vegetables and so forth? No. The most nutrient-dense food is actually meat, right? Meat, chicken, fish, turkey, eggs. So if you're eating that food, you're going to get plenty of calcium in it. And then when you eat your vegetables, you've got to eat some vegetables with it. Now, if you look at it, stick spinach, you'd never think spinach has a lot of calcium. It does. It has a lot of calcium in it. So you're going to get plenty of calcium in the foods. And that little calcium that might be in spinach compared to other foods, but it, it's all bioabsorbable because it comes packaged that way. So if you take a calcium tablet and you whip it down, it's going right through into your toilet. You hardly absorb and you don't metabolize any of that. So there's studies to show that elemental calcium supplementation increases cardiovascular risk, actually. So you don't want to take calcium on its own. Nature wants you to absorb calcium in its natural state with everything else. So I don't take calcium tablets. I don't give my wife calcium tablets. Her bone density is just fine. Not a problem. So calcium, no, do not take supplements. The, the supplement you should be taking is magnesium. Okay, and the reason why you want to take magnesium is because today's vegetables don't have magnesium. Even today's meat doesn't have much magnesium. There's not much magnesium in our water either. So we are all magnesium deficient. So I like magnesium torate, but other people like other forms of magnesium. Uh, I have no, no issues with glycinate. Magnesium glycinate is also all right. Magnesium citrate causes diarrhea. Um, so, but if you have constipation, then take magnesium citrate. So I have no problem with that. Hello, thank you for your talk. It's very awesome, lots of information. But you threw me on two things, like I ate a lot of spaghetti squash and then I saw the sweet potatoes. So I, I was, I wondered if you could elaborate that on that. And then I also heard you say, I put lotion on my body every day, but I'm wondering if I'm putting toxins. Yes, okay, the first part is spaghetti squash. I love spaghetti squash because that's, that's made from squash and squash is a whole product. I have no problem with that. And all you've done with it is made it look like spaghetti so you can eat it. So I have no problem with that whatsoever. So, but, so the, 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 the spaghetti I have no problem with. And the other food you mentioned was? Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, okay. Sweet potatoes is also a whole food. I have no problem with sweet potato because it comes with the fiber, it's completely packaged and you're eating the whole thing. I have no issues with sweet potato unless you're severely overweight, obese. If you're not dealing with weight loss, I am, I've reached my ideal body weight, then you can have that. Absolutely no problem. My sugar's under good control. You can have it. Not a problem. But not a problem. Because you're getting fat. Now, white potatoes have a much higher glycemic index than sweet potatoes. So generally speaking, I don't like too much potatoes. But sweet potatoes, I have no problem with that. No problem with sweet potatoes. So you can have sweet potatoes. So you're, you're okay with that. And it's not going to bump up your sugar. Now, for those of you who have continuous glucose monitoring, you notice that when you eat a regular potato, your blood sugar spikes right after eating potato. But when you take sweet potato, 
There is a small spike, but it's just a, a mild spike. I do like continuous glucose monitoring for that reason. So all of us have a slightly different physiology. If you're really concerned about which foods are really helping you and which ones are not, and you don't want to spike your sugar because that's your problem you're dealing with. Let's say you have insulin resistance, high insulin levels, diabetes, then I suggest that you get a continuous glucose monitor. You can buy it. It's about $500. So what you do is they put that little button on you, and you just monitor, so you have your meal, you check it out, and you can see what, which one is causing that big spike in sugar. And you say, okay, that food does it, that food did it, that food did it, you can avoid those. So people who are doing that, I get great results when they do that, because now it's like a biofeedback. They're getting their own information back and it's changing their behavior. So continuous glucose monitoring is something I really endorse very much. And then the last question that you had was about your lotion. On our body lotion. Yeah, you know what? You don't have lotion deficiency, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> These lotions were not made for anything but to sell it you. And one, they have perfumes in them. And these perfumes may or may not be good for you. But what I don't like is phthalates. Those are plasticizers. That's what gives it that creamy texture. Those phthalates get absorbed and you, you take a shower with, with the body lotion on it, and you, you, you do it like the, the ones that you use, right? Then urinate for the next two hours, you'll see very high concentrations of phthalates in them. So phthalates are plasticizers, they're plastics. They, they go into the body and they, they call estrogen, estrogen stimulators. So they, they disrupt your in, insulin in your body. And that is why I don't like them. Because they, 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 anything that interferes with your hormones. You see what I just say? You're a hormonally modified human being. Don't mess with your hormones. We don't know much about hormones. Anything that's going to affect your hormone, you should be very careful about. I don't mess with uh, any creams, plasticizers on my skin. Now, unless you have eczema and you really have really bad skin, yeah, you can put that on there. But I saw another patient the other day using a lot of sunscreen. She uses sunscreen day in and day out. She said, I live in Florida. I put sunscreen in the morning, even in the afternoon. Her vitamin D levels were 20. 20. Besides that, I can guarantee you that part of her problems that she's having is because she's messed up her estrogens and uh, st stimulation, estrogen stimulation. So I told her, you've got to cut this out, and you'll see how, how good you'll start feeling. So there's she'll not a natural form. There's no natural... There are natural creams that you can buy that don't have any of the plasticizers mm -hmm. and phthalate-free, plastic-free creams. They are available. You've got to go to certain stores that carry those brands, but they are available, yes. Um, uh, growing up as a kid in Africa, uh, we just used to put Vaseline, and Vaseline doesn't get absorbed, but Vaseline is a nice moisturizer as well. It keeps the moisture inside for my dry skin when we were little. Mm -hmm. That's it. What about glycerin for our skin? Gold seal? Glycerin. Oh, glycerin. Glycerin's fine. Glycerin's excellent. You see? So the soap, for example, I use simple soap. Simple soap that doesn't contain anything except pure soap and it's mostly glycerin. So I don't use the regular soaps because they're full of all these chemicals in them. They colorizers and too many plasticizers in them. So I don't use regular soap either. I want to be as natural as I can because the environment is giving me all the toxins I need anyway. You know, it's terrible. Terrible. My name, I'm going to do a talk on pollution, mm. environmental pollution in general, and what we can do in our home. What can we do at home to prevent pollution? Because a lot of it is indoor pollution and in the food that we eat and the environment and things like this. What you put on your skin, what you put on your face, and what you wash your hair with, what you even wash your dishes with, your clothes with. And there's so many things we can talk about, about just pollution. So I'm going to talk about pollution as well. Because... You know, there, it all, so what's that got to do with the heart? It has everything to do with everything. You know, the heart is not as just an organ as this. All these other things affect the heart as well, and the cardiovascular system. It affects the arteries, and you are nothing but a bunch of arteries that are supplying organs. If the arteries get messed up, that organ doesn't work very well. And all your arteries are the same, whether they're the heart, the carotid, the renals, uh, it's intracerebral, they're all the same. We must take care of our arteries. You are as old as your arteries. That's why everything we talk about here is to keep your arteries nice and healthy. You're as old as your arteries. Keep your arteries healthy. Everything else will take care of itself. And we've just gone on to the wrong road. And it all started because I told you before, 
It all started because of the bad information about fats. The wrong information about mm -hmm. fats, because someone had to blame something because the president died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And then along comes somebody who wants to make a name for himself, mm -hmm. Governor McGovern. Yeah. <laughs> and then, oh, and so Keys had to make a big name about the fat thing, so he was the one who blamed it. And then these people took it to the legislation and made it rule now. Okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then the nation is so good. They followed it to the T. And here we are today. Worse off than we ever were before. <coughs> That's, you see, being a cardiologist, my biggest fr frustration was just this, that I can fix an artery if it's blocked. Well, what can I do to prevent that blockage in the first place? I had nothing. I had some. I always did some preventive stuff. But what I was doing was really just scraping the surface. It really wasn't doing much. So as I started reading more and more, I got so excited about all the different things, especially about diet. But now I'm getting into other things too. Fasting, which is not dieting. It's different. <coughs> Fasting is different from dieting. And then I'm getting into other things, such as sauna, environmental pollution, they, how they influence your body as well. Ice dunks and how that can also improve your physiology. Sleep, heavy into sleep. I'm going to do one talk on sleep and how sleep, what is sleep and what, how should we sleep and how much should we sleep and how should we get to sleep and what can we do to get deeper sleep and how do you know you're even getting good sleep? How do you know the quality of the sleep that you're having instead of just quantity? What's about the quality? How do you measure it? And what are we doing to disrupt that? And how does that affect your cardiovascular system? And it's huge how it affects your cardiovascular system. So we're talking about sleep, we're talking about the environment, we're talking about your food. We're talking about uh, heat, cold, supplements, herbs. So we want to kind of hack our body into health again using all these different modalities. And get rid of all these old thoughts that we had about, you know, we were really misled. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were misled, you know. Yeah. So thank you all for being such a great audience. And um, look for my next one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.